Amen. Good afternoon, Macedonia. It is my honor and privilege to stand before you at this great occasion. Uh, as you say, sometimes there are stages that are too big for you, occasions that are too big for you. Uh, Pastor, with his legacy and the work that he's done, could have chosen any preacher in the country to come and honor him on his 32nd anniversary. But somehow I was chosen. Even my wife asked me, how did they pick you? I said, I don't know. They just asked. And I wasn't smart enough to say no. So we have it and we're here today. We want to thank God for Pastor Barnes. Uh, and especially, I want to say thank you to his family, who's in the first row, second row, third row. As Reverend Wilson just mentioned, I grew up in the house with a pastor. And so for the first 21 years, I sat on those rows. And I know the sacrifice that was made in our family to share my dad with the church. So I know the sacrifice that you make to share Pastor Barnes with us. And we appreciate that sacrifice. Amen. Amen. All right. We got the preliminary out of the way. Let's go to work. If you can have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. Book of Galatians. Chapter 6. Going to read verses 6 through 9. Reads like this from the King James Version of the Bible. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. From that last verse, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. For a few moments today, I want to talk from this topic, due season is coming. Due season is coming. You may be seated in the house of God. Let's pray. God, our Father, we are grateful and thankful for this opportunity. And even as we stand before your people on today, we pray that you speak through these lips of clay. You know what we've been talking about all week, and I just pray it's in your grace to do it right now. We thank you for this time and this opportunity. Bless that the word might go forth to touch the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We live in an instant gratification culture. Humans are actually hardwired to desire things, to want things. Even a baby, when they're born, they can't talk, but they realize when they're hungry, all they got to do is yell. And when they yell, somebody is going to come to their rescue to attend to what it is that they desire. The difficulty with the culture that we have now is that people are no longer conditioned to wait. We have a culture that is pushing us to be impatient. According to a survey by the Curious Bank, more than half of Americans will hang up the phone after being kept on hold for one minute or less. That same survey said 96% of people will knowingly consume extremely hot food or drinks that burn their mouths. <laughs> Done that before. You get a cheese pizza and it's hot and you're hungry. What it does to the top of your mouth, not good. And I know many of you had done that same thing. Because we are impatient. We can't wait. Another survey said that 45% of millennials said that technology has made them more impatient today than they were five years ago. People don't even want to wait 10 minutes for Uber. 
As a matter of fact, now I can even pick up my phone and I can go to Uber Eats. I don't even have to wait in line. I can go to my phone right now, order me a milkshake from McDonald's, and before I finish my sermon, somebody will be walking in here with my milkshake. Because we don't want to wait for nothing. Tinder, grinder. We don't even want to meet people. We want to slide through pictures, swipe right or swipe left. See, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. The rest of y'all, don't worry about it. But we've become impatient. And here's the problem. That mindset has now infected Christians. When we pray, we want God to answer our prayer before we get up off our knees. What I'm here to let you know today is that we've got to learn how to have patience because due season is coming. Here, let's understand the background of this epistle. This epistle was written by Paul, and Paul wrote this not to a specific church or to churches of a single city, but he wrote it to the churches in the providence of Galatia. That's writing, that's like writing a letter to all the churches in the state of Florida. And so because of that, it was what we call a circular letter. It was intended to be read in all of the churches in the providence of Galatia. And this, according to theologians, is Paul's most intense letter. And the reason they say that is you can see his anger at what was going on because he admitted his usual expression of praise after his opening. He didn't do that in Galatians, but he went right to the problem because we know Paul founded the churches that are in Galatia. He tells you that in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, but others, after he founded the church, probably from Jerusalem, came to Galatia and began to teach things that were contrary to what Paul taught. Those who came, those false teachers, here's what they began to teach. They began to teach that it was necessary to supplement Faith in Christ with obedience to the law of Moses. What they taught specifically is that circumcision was required for salvation. What they taught is that you had to be circumcised as a Gentile in order to be converted to Judaism. That you couldn't be saved unless you were circumcised. That's why those false teachers were called Judaizers trying to make people go back to Judaism. Now, I don't know who, in char- who was at the church who was in charge of finding out who was circumcised or not. I wouldn't have wanted that job. <laughs> but they were trying to make sure that everybody had been circumcised. So when Paul wrote this letter, he was writing this letter to forcefully present his position that justification comes by the grace of God, by faith alone, in Christ alone. By justification, here's what Paul meant. He meant that we could now be declared guiltless when we stand before God. That even though you messed up, you did the crime, he says you can stand before God guiltless when you have been justified. Not only can you stand before God guiltless, but now you would become a part of God's covenant community. That one's salvation was in no way contingent upon relying on observing the law of Moses. What he was writing is that if you observe that law, what you were demonstrating is that you lack the necessary faith in Christ alone to be sufficient for salvation. Let me summarize these first five chapters that gets us to our text in chapter one. What Paul said in chapter one is that you've already went to a different gospel. He says, the gospel that I preached to you when I came, it didn't come from me. It came by revelation of Christ himself. He says, but you're going to something different. In chapter two, he told them, I went to Jerusalem. I met the leaders in Jerusalem and I opposed Cephas to the face about circumcision. I let him know that we are justified by faith in Christ and not by works. 
Then he gets to chapter 3. He says, those of us who are of faith, we're blessed just like Abraham. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So he says, when you're in Christ, that makes us all sons of God just by faith in Christ. Then in chapter 4, he said the reason Christ came is so that we can receive adoption into the family. That was his whole purpose for coming so that we could be a part of the family. So how are you going to turn back to those worthless principles of the law? He says you got to realize that you're just like Isaac. Who is Isaac? Isaac is the promised seed of Abraham. He's the promise that came to Abraham when God told Abraham he was going to be the father of many nations. That promise was fulfilled in Isaac. And he says, when we accept Jesus Christ, we're just like Isaac, fulfilling the promise that God gave us to become children of God just by faith in Christ. Then he says, because of that, in chapter 5, Christ has set us free. Circumcision doesn't count for anything now. He says, now use your freedom to love one another. Use your freedom now to walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. That we've got to learn how to walk by the spirit. He says it very plainly in chapter 5, verse number 19. Chapter 5, verse 19, he says this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That's just a big word to say that you're being outrageous and you have uncontrolled lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. He says, of the which I tell you before, as I told you in the past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Letting them know that there is now a requirement for those who, of us who are saved not to be bound by sin because we've been freed from it by the blood of Jesus. Not to continue in that lifestyle because that is now forfeiting what Christ did. That we can't walk according to the flesh, but he gives us the way that we should walk. He says, now, but walk, but the fruit of the Spirit. Walk according to the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That we now, instead of walking by the flesh, have to walk by the Spirit. But even as we walk by the Spirit, here's what we always have to be mindful of. That occasionally, some people are going to mess up. Some of us are going to fall. Some of us are going to slip up. And he says, and when that happens, he says in chapter 6, he says, if a man is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. What we've got to learn how to do, church, is we can't always kick people when they're down. We've got to learn how for those who are the household of faith, how to restore them. That word restore means to put back into place. It's like a bone that pops out of joint. When my son played high school football, he got his shoulder knocked out of joint. And when that shoulder came out of joint, it was so painful and debilitating, it was hard for him to stand upright, even though there was nothing wrong with his legs. It was just the pain in the shoulder that was out of place that caused him to be incapacitated. It's the same way in the body of Christ. When we allow Christians to be out of joint, it incapacitates our fellowship. That's why he says restore them. To put them back into joint. To put them back in the place. But you don't do it by lording over them. He says you do it in the spirit of meekness. You know why? Because you might be the next one out of joint. So because of that, he says, now that's why we bear one another burdens. We help one another. We put people back in place. We restore those that have been overtaken. He says, because we have to do it in the spirit of meekness. Because in verse 3, he says, because if a man thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Here's what that means. That word something there actually means if a man thinks that he is holy. 
here. So let me rephrase that in modern English. If you think you God and you can't mess up when you are truly not God, you done fooled yourself. That now we have to be careful because we are not God. We are susceptible to issues and problems so we can't be deceived. That's why we've got to be able to be happy when we ain't messing up. That's what he says in the next verse, verse 4. But let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. He's saying, now, if you are doing a good job, be happy that you're doing a good job because we all have work to do. That's what we have to realize that as Christians, and we all have a job to do that is not just on the pastor, but we have a responsibility to look after the work that God has given us. That gets us Right to our text in our text now it says this in verse six, let every let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Here's my first point. The first point is this. Do share with the teacher. Do share with the teacher. When you look at this verse, it's wonderful that we are commending Pastor Barnes and recognizing him for his 32 years of service. That should be done, but that's not all that should be done. Because I told you in the first part of the book, he was warning against false teachers, those who were coming in and teaching a different gospel. When he gets to this point, he's now saying there's a responsibility to take care of true teachers. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. This word communicate here means to make another's necessities one's own as to relieve them. So it's not just words. You don't just say, thank you, Pastor Barnes, you're doing a great job. But it means as a church body, we are responsible for taking care of his necessities. Y'all real quiet now. Here's why that is. Because if he is teaching the truth concerning the word of God, he imparts to us words of life. I've been here now for 16 and a half years, almost 17 years. There have been many times when I showed up at 412 East Kennedy Boulevard where I really needed a word from God. And when Pastor Barnes stood up, whether it was on Sunday morning, on Thursday night, in discipleship class, in Sunday school class, because he wasn't worried about the necessities of life, because he spent time with God when he spoke, God sent a word to me through him where it felt like no matter how many people were there it was just me and God because God sent the word that I needed for my life through Pastor Barnes but he can't spend the time in the word if he's concerned about paying his light bill that's why it says share with him in all good things so that now it's our responsibility for the true teachers not false teachers but true teachers and we have one who rightly divides the word of truth it becomes our responsibility to make sure his necessities are taken care of so that God can speak to him so that he can speak to us that words of life are imparted unto us So the first point is do share with the teacher. Second point is this. In verse 7, it says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. First point is do share with the teacher. Second point is do sow to the spirit. Here's what Paul warns. He says, don't be tricked. Don't be fooled. God is not to be toyed with. God is not to be played with. God is not to be tested. While God is your friend, he's not one of your little friends. I had to tell my son that. My son, we had a great relationship and we play and we joke, but I had to let him know, even though we play and we joke, I ain't one of your little friends. So what he was letting us know, he says, don't think you can get by on God. 
God is not to be tested because whatever you do in life, whatever you sow, he says, that is what you're going to reap. He lays out a principle of God, a life principle. It says, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. If you plant corn, you're going to reap corn. If you plant apples, you're going to reap apples. So the question is, what in life are you sowing in? Because if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap what the flesh produces. Look at verse 8. He says, for if you sow to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. That there means death, that which is perishing. He was really saying, referring back to what I read in chapter 5 about those who now walk after the flesh. If you stay in that lifestyle, then you will forfeit salvation. Because you have not truly converted. He says, now, don't sow to the flesh, but sow to the spirit. Here's what you get when you sow to the spirit. You reap life everlasting. Here's what we got to understand. We got to understand the benefit and the power of everlasting life. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 to 18 say this. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Here's what it's saying. That no matter what you have to go through down here, that's nothing compared to the glory we'll have in heaven. That whatever... You experience down here how burdensome it seems. It's a light affliction because the glory that exists in heaven is so much greater. Goes on to say in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So it's not about what we see. We always quote what it says in Corinthians, for we walk by not by. So it's not about what we see. So many times when you sow to the spirit, you might not see the benefits yet. You might not see the benefits right now. You might not see it happening, but keep sowing to the spirit. First point is do share with the teacher. Second point, keep sowing to the spirit. Do so to the spirit. And here's the third point. You need to do well without weariness. In verse 9, he says, and let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we'll reap if we faint not. Here's what we have to know is that we have to continue to do well without getting tired because we don't always immediately see the benefit of doing well. We get discouraged. We think that if we plant an apple seed today, you got to know you're not going to eat an apple pie tomorrow from that seed you planted yesterday. Doesn't work that way. It takes time. And that's why you can't be weary in well-doing. Because of the impatience we get from the culture, we want to give up. Because it appears in life that the good guys finish last. Because it appears in life that the wicked get away with evil. Because it appears in life that those who don't want to do right seem to get away with it. But I'm here to let you know, due season is coming. That's why you have to do well without weariness. People will even try to discourage you. They'll ask you, why are you doing that? People don't appreciate you. People don't know what you're doing. You're worth more than that. You ain't got to take that. You ought to just run away from that. I'm here to encourage you. Do well without weariness. Do well without weariness. Because here's the last point. Because due season is coming. Here's what you got to understand about due season, that it takes time for it to happen. You see, when a seed gets planted in the dirt, when it's buried in the dirt, many times people think that's the end of it. We think we are buried. But what I'm here to let you know is that you're not buried. You're only planted. When you're in the dirt, you're saying people don't appreciate me. People throwing dirt on me. Yes, they might be throwing dirt on you, but you're not buried. You're just planted. Because once a seed is planted in the dirt, 
The seed itself has to die. Once the seed dies, then it begins to germinate. Once it begins to germinate, then it grows roots in the ground. Once it grows root, then it can get nourishment. Once it gets nourishment, then it bursts through the dirt just as a little budding. But once it bursts through the dirt, then it has to grow and become a tree and mature and then produces fruit. We've got to understand that even if people are throwing dirt on us, we're not buried, we're planted. We've got to understand that God's got to do some work. Because even with the great farmers of the world, if they plant a seed, all they can do is plant a seed and till the ground. It's God that germinates the seed. It's God that supplies the rain from the sky. You can get a hose, but you're going to have to do a whole lot of spraying with a hose to water a field. You can't create the sunshine necessary to germinate the seed. That's God's work. All you can do is plant the seed, till the ground, and wait for God to do his work. And when God does his work, due season will come. That's why James says it this way in chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. That's why we can't be weary in well-doing because due season is coming. If you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in due time. Cast your cares on him because he careth for you. Yes, due season is coming. Uh, I know some people say, but I, I can't take it. I, I can't hang in there any longer. I can't do it. What I'm here to let you know, do share. Do so. Do well, for due season is coming. There's a song that I found that I've been in church all my life, and I'd never heard this song before. The name of the song, as I get ready to close, is called, He Giveth Grace. It's, about, it's by this lady named Annie Johnson Flint. Let me tell you the story of Annie Johnson Flint and read you the words of this beautiful hymn that she wrote to let you know that even if you think you can't hold out, God will give you grace until due season comes. Annie Johnson Flint. And she was born as Annie Johnson in the, in the 1800s. And she's born as Annie Johnson. And then she, she had a younger sister. And shortly after her younger sister was born, her mother died in her early 20s. So she was left with her, her sister, and her dad. Her dad now began to live with another woman who did not like Annie nor her little sister. So she treated them horribly. And shortly after they moved there and they were getting that horrible treatment, her father contracted an incurable disease and he died also. So now Annie and her younger sister were in this household where this lady did not like them. But there was the Flint family down the street. The Flint family was a God-fearing family. And so the Flint family took in Annie and her little sister and began to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And everything was going well, but Annie, when she hit her mid-twenties, got, again, she actually became ill. She had multiple diseases that attacked her body to the point that she became crippled. She was not able to walk and she couldn't care for herself, had lost control even of her own bowels, had to wear diapers and now was bedridden and dependent on adult care in her mid-twenties. And so she needed someone to care for her. But in this condition and through the atrocities of her life, here are the words that she penned of this hymn called, He Giveth More Grace. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials, his multiplied peace. 
When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known unto men. And out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Fear not that thy need shall exceed his provision. Our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on the arm everlasting availing the Father, both thee and thy load will upbear. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Do share. Do so. Do well. For due season is coming. Do share. Do so. Do well. For due season is coming. Here's what you get in due season. You reap life eternal. Here's what I got to let you know. Even if you don't think it's worth it down here, let me try to describe what heaven is like to give you a picture of why it's worth waiting on God. You see, when we get to heaven, the Bible tells us there are streets that are paved with gold. It says when we get to heaven, the sun doesn't have to shine anymore because God himself will light up the city. I like the way the old folks used to say it. When you get to heaven, is howdy howdy and never goodbye I like the way my daddy used to say it he called it the land of no more no more sorrow no more trials no more pain no more tears no more death I'll be with the father I'll be with the savior I'll be happy forevermore I don't know about you but I'm waiting for due season to come I got patience to wait on God because due season is coming I can't wait to get there can't wait to see my savior face to face because due season is coming Stand to your feet all over the sanctuary. You might be going through difficulty. Might be going through trial. Might be going through trouble. But here's what I'm here to let you know. That it will be worth it after a while. The only way that it's worth it is that if you give your life to Christ. That you don't sow to the flesh, but you sow to the spirit. That you do well without getting tired and you will be rewarded by and by. We want to encourage our pastor today in this message and encourage each one of you that if your life is a life that is without Christ, this is the opportunity for you to come to Christ and to give him your life in order that you can now be one of the beneficiaries of due season. Is there one that will come today if you don't have a church home? We can make Macedonia your church home. If you're out of the ark of safety, this is an opportunity to join with our family. If there is one that is here today, you can give your life to Christ as the choir sings and as they come to sing today. <laughs>